Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, uh, everyone, for being here. Um, thanks again to Andreas and the Fame Lab. Um, Stephanie Beachler and I, just, just a quick introduction for Stephanie. She's an undergraduate student at Chatham University. Uh, we've been thinking and discussing um, and it sort of um, experiencing a lot within the area of movement philosophy. So we've been thinking a lot about movement philosophy in different ways, um, one of which, of course, being physical movement, like with exercise. Uh, so we've been thinking a lot about that particular area, movement philosophy, and what we're sort of trying to do in this particular presentation is actually take these ideas and these concepts that we've been thinking about with movement and apply them to sort of a, a bigger picture type situation. So we're actually looking at discussing some, um, some examples in education, academics, and research. So we'll see how it goes. It's the first time we've um, discussed this in this type of setting, so we're kind of excited to share some of our ideas. So specialization can be important and useful, particularly for job opportunities. It can provide an individual with a unique set of skills. Um, in education, uh, it tends to be focused on a specific topic through your course of education. And in research, an individual tends to focus on a path of their research that focuses on a um, subject or specific topic. And some examples within education are trade schools. Uh, for an example, an auto mechanic will go to a school that focuses on auto mechanics and provides him or her with a unique set of skills that then allows them for job opportunities within that field. And universities uh, provide an individual with bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees, for example. And um, those are usually focused within a particular subject or within a realm of a similar subject. And athletics, um, an athlete will usually focus on a specific sport, such as gymnastics, soccer, and dance, or dance. And so specialization, though, can lead to routine. And the question is whether routine is a good, is useful or not. And um, the answer is that it is a U-shaped relationship. And uh, so it can be useful for certain <coughs> things, but detrimental for others. It can be useful for things such as eating habits. So timing of eating might be good to eat at similar times of the day. A lot of people do. And uh, eating similar foods and understanding which foods affect your body in which ways. Uh, physical training. So exercising at similar times in the day can lead a person to be more consistent with their training. And work habits, as we've noticed here in Greece, um, our work habits have kind of been thrown off. We have, I think, taken for granted always having access to internet, always having a desk to work at. So we've kind of fallen out of our routine since we've been here. And so it can also be detrimental for things because too much routine can lead to sort of being comfortable and being stagnant and kind of falling into a rut of habitual activities. And so routine and productivity can be shown on this U-shaped graph. Um, too little routine can be kind of chaotic and a person can, will then not be as productive as they could be. Too much routine um, and a person can fall into the habitual practices and not really push themselves out of their comfort zone. So there is an optimal level of routine where a person is the most productive and um, that can often be found with consistent eating, sleep, work habits, and kind of exploring uh, further things uh, outside of those realms. Okay, so Let's take an example, um, and the example that we'll look at is, and this is an example of specialization. And so we'll look at specialization within, um, you know, education. Okay, so, and actually, so here we have uh, an individual who completes their bachelor's degree in sports science, and then moves on to complete a master's degree, okay, in sports science, let's say focusing on something 
straightforward. Okay, we're going to pick a very straightforward example. So focusing on something like caffeine and exercise performance. Okay, so they complete a master's degree investigating this. Then they move on to complete a PhD, again in let's say a sports science department, investigating caffeine. Let's say they've they've uh, started to expand a little bit and they're looking at timing, dose, type of caffeine and how that impacts performance. Right. So this is the path that this individual has followed to become a specialist in their area. So this individual is an expert in caffeine, right, and how it relates to performance. So the question is, especially after you complete a PhD, you know, in, in some cases, you know, you're considered an expert. And the question is, is what do you do after becoming an expert? And so the, the and this is just an example, it could be something else like um, again, something in athletics, or we've been thinking more about in terms of movement, but in this case we're looking at um, education. So what to do after you become an expert. And so a routine has essentially been established. Okay, so you know or you, be, you believe that there is a, an optimal way to administer caffeine, let's say through tablet or gum or whatever. Um, you know which type of, or you believe that there are certain athletes that would mostly benefit from caffeine, which would be, let's say, endurance athletes. That's what the research tends to show. And then you know and you believe that there are certain tests that efficiently test and examine the impact that caffeine has on performance. So you've become very comfortable and familiar with the testing, the strategies, the various ways of examining that relationship, right? So you're an expert. So what now? Okay, so, and the way we'll proceed with what now may seem sort of obvious, but for a lot of individuals, I don't think that this approach is very um, common. And I think certain people it comes naturally to, like Dr. Flores, I think has a very sort of natural um, way with this, but for others it's a little bit more difficult. So. With the expert, right, we have the caffeine expert. There are multiple directions you could go with after becoming an expert. I'm going to just focus on two options. So option one, and this all has to do with energy distribution. Where do you want to put your energy? Where do you want to, what do you want to focus on, right? Option one, you read more papers in your area right? Continue to read every single new paper that comes out. Be up to date on all the literature. Or, and also continue to conduct incremental research. So let's say, okay, this, let's just continue with, maybe let's give a higher dosage. Let's, uh, let's try and look at anaerobic um, training to see if that's beneficial. Let's play around with things. Very incremental, right? Little sort of steps along the way, which isn't bad or good or anything. It's just one option. So the other option, which is the option we're going to focus on, is diversity. So diversifying yourself. Um, and so this is sort of where we're going to focus on today. Okay? But again, there are, of course, infinite amount of options. We're just looking at these two for right now. So as we move, before we move forward, okay, and I, just thinking about that, that diversity approach okay, after becoming an expert, I just really want to share this quote. Uh, it's one of my favorite quotes from Alfred North Whitehead and who wrote this book Modes of Thought and it was written in 1938. Life degenerates when enclosed within the shackles of mere confirmation. A power of incorporating vague and disorderly elements of experience is essential for the advance into novelty. So what he's saying, and, and Alfred North Whitehead is um, from the UK, mathematician um, who was offered a position at Harvard as a philosophy professor. So this, this individual is really interesting. What I really like about this quote is right here. So a power of incorporating vague and disorderly elements of experience. So he's, he's essentially saying to intentionally incorporate disorder into your life is what he's saying, okay? So, so this, again, is related to that diversity uh, op option that we talked about previously. So to go along with that, okay, so intentionally incorporating disorder into your life. So 
There's been a few individuals who have written about this. Um, and there's been a lot of terms used to describe this. One of the terms that we like is uh, chaotic order, okay? So chaotic order is, is a type of chaos. And when you hear chaos, right, it's kind of, uh, it, it sort of has like a negative feel to it, right? Something chaotic, chaos, and, and that's true if, if depending on how you think about chaos and how you define it. So we want to sort of be clear with what we mean when we say chaotic order, right? So one type of chaos would be random, random chaos. Like let's say I walk up to the window and break the window for, for no reason. That's kind of something that you wouldn't normally do, right? A little bit chaotic out of the ordinary. Ordered chaos, okay? Study abroad trip, like these four undergraduate students are on right now, okay? Um, three of the four have never been to Greece. Uh, we're visiting a, you know, a foreign university, never been here before, learning new techniques in the lab. Okay, this is sort of a chaotic thing, and I've seen how it's caused some disorder with them during the past three weeks since we've been here. Okay, but that's ordered intentional chaos, not random. Okay? So, what's the difference then between this random chaos and this ordered or chaotic order is that the random chaos, okay, there's no foresight or potential future benefit that comes out of it, right? With the ordered chaos that you've intentionally incorporated into your life, there's the anticipation of some sort of future development or benefit that can come out of it, right? So, and that word is, is foresight, being able to foresee something useful coming out of a situation that may cause some disorder. So that future benefit may be unknown at the time. So you don't know what will come out of it, but you have some sort of feeling that it's, it's, it could lead to something interesting in the future. Okay, so here's another interesting quote that goes along with that from E.F. Schumacher who wrote A Guide for the Perplexed. A person may move to another place not because present conditions motivate him to do so, but because he anticipates in his mind certain future developments. Okay, so the, again, that thing with that idea of foresight. So intentionally incorporating this ordered chaos into your life can cause an individual to feel stressed and uncertain about the outcome and uncomfortable. But it's important to just remember that this is all normal when you're experiencing something that you've never experienced before, that you're not aware of what's going to come from it, and to really just anticipate and accept these sort of emotions. And so productivity and chaos is also has a U-shaped relationship with too little chaos, um, leading a person to fall into these habits and fall into routine too much chaos, making a person feel overwhelmed, and both ends of the spectrum leading to decreased productivity. But with an optimal level of chaos that can be um, implemented with intentionally introducing this ordered chaos into your life, then productivity can be at its full potential. Okay, so we're back to this caffeine expert, right? And so Again, we have the, the option one where you continue with incremental research and continue to uh, um, read every paper in your area or option two where you sort of diversify yourself or, or embrace that whole idea of chaotic order. And so let's say that this expert has chosen option two. So what do you start doing? So you start putting yourself into uncomfortable situations where um, you anticipate that discomfort and that stress that goes along with it, but you are entering into a new area, right? Like psychology, okay? You're in a sports science um, uh, department and you start to venture and read about or meet with people in psychology. Genetics, okay? Biochemistry, cardiology, aging, philosophy. Okay, so you start to start to um, um, tinker with other sort of areas of, of, uh, of study. And eventually what you sort of, I guess what 
a goal for me in this would be to have some sort of situational excellence, be able to kind of um, enter different areas, be able to have a conversation and relate back to, let's say, your specialization, okay? Because it should serve some purpose. So let's look at, um, right now, okay, we have sort of a nice structure happening. Before we have this sort of vertical structure here, when you actually look at it, it doesn't seem very stable, right? It could collapse quite easily. When you start adding to it, you have a lot more stability here, right? Just by looking at the structure. So then you start to think about how stable, okay, your sort of realm of experience actually is. You have this, okay, which could topple over quite easily if stressed versus this, which is a lot more stable as described before here. So with these realms of experience, okay, the next step, right, is to actually see what sort of connections exist with your specialization, okay? And so one interesting thing here with caffeine and performance and genetics. Let's say that you have become very comfortable with the idea that caffeine improves performance, especially with endurance exercise, okay? That's something that has been published in the literature quite a bit. But if you read the literature carefully, you see that there actually are some responders to caffeine and non-responders to caffeine when it comes to their improvement for for exercise performance, particularly um, aerobic exercise. Um, and so what you start to do is read about, okay, let's see what's, what's happening here. And I think actually Tanya did such a good job picking apart her research question, looking at all kinds of different areas. And I think that was such a great example of this. But so you, you start to read about genetics a little bit and you say, oh, okay, wow. Um, if you think about how caffeine is metabolized in the body, there's a certain enzyme responsible for that metabolism of caffeine. And a certain polymorphism, okay, that uh, codes for that particular enzyme is associated with a slower metabolism of caffeine. So they've actually come up based on information from polymorphisms that there are, this is a theory of course, fast and slow metabolizers of caffeine. And they found that a few studies have found that individuals who metabolize caffeine faster actually can get more benefit, uh, ergogenic benefit from caffeine with respect to their endurance performance. So there's that interesting connection there. Biochemistry. When, when caffeine is broken down, it's broken down into three primary metabolites. If you want to be able to measure those metabolites and actually give a sort of a comprehensive description of what's happening when you consume caffeine, you need to be able to measure that using biochemical techniques, right? Another interesting relationship here, remember those fast and slow caffeine metabolizers? The individuals who metabolize caffeine slower, when they consume caffeine, they end, they, the research, some research has shown that those individuals have a higher risk of, uh, of cardiovascular disease, of developing cardiovascular disease. So there's another relationship established here. Psychology, okay? Um, individuals who tend to metabolize caffeine faster also seem to be more anxious when they consume caffeine versus those who metabolize caffeine slower. So now there's a, a relationship here with, with psychology, specifically with anxiety. So there's all kinds of interesting relationships uh, that exist between all of these different ideas that we've shown here. And so what you have basically is this structure, okay, that's starting to um, develop here that is very stable, right? It's very stable. Um, there's a lot of movement, okay, that can take place in and around this structure, and there's a lot of potential for movement to, to occur within this structure as well. So that essentially leads to meaning, right? If you look at the definition of meaning on, online, you see that it's defined as um, intended to communicate something that is not directly expressed, okay? Online definition. So the way that happens, okay, so there's some, some uh, vagueness there with something, and meaning is to be able to explain that vague idea more clearly. And so the way that um, certain individuals 
have defined meaning, okay, or that you can that can lead to meaning is relational possibilities or these red dots. So the more possibility you have for creating relationships or connections, okay, the more meaning you'll be able to get out of your experience. So you have chaotic order, right? Intentionally incorporating disorder into your life, relational possibilities, right? Being able to create the potential for these connections to occur, which leads to meaning, right? Being able to explain something that is not directly expressed. So we have this um, figure here, right? We have the, the specialist, okay? And our example is the uh, caffeine uh, expert and how caffeine relates to performance. So he lives in this area. And within this circle, the caffeine expert is very comfortable. He can move all over this circle, okay, with confidence, and he feels great, and, and that's excellent. But we want to sort of embrace this approach, okay? So you have, if you look at this sort of bigger circle, it's more of like a generalist approach. So you have these different sort of areas um, of, of uh, inquiry, okay, within this sort of generalist approach. So what do you want to do is sort of, instead of having this closed circle, right, expand that specialist circle, make it a dotted line, okay? So that means that you're open, right? You're open to anything that may be interesting for you and, and may serve your purpose of developing your specialty. And so the way to do that would be through this process of, of chaotic order. Okay, so again, this is our first time trying to explain this outside of the realm of movement and exercise. And so we've been really thinking a lot about this with respect to the current way that um, people exercise and the current way that people think about fitness. So there seems to be a lot changing um, within the, the exercise and fitness industry. Um, and the way that people think about it. And one of the problems, I think, is the ambiguity that surrounds some of the language. So, for example, if you think about exercise, okay, and Stephanie's going to take over shortly here, but if you think of exercise as within the specialist box and movement, okay, within the generalist area, it becomes very different. But oftentimes, movement and exercise are considered synonyms. Okay, for example, we are in the Department of Exercise Science, but we have a course in our department that is movement science. So there's a bit of a, of a disconnect there, um, and it causes some ambiguity when you think about it. So let's define exercise and movement so that we can be more clear with those concepts. So one definition of exercise is an activity where an individual reaps the physical benefits of the activity. So training for a marathon, the person does these movements or exercises um, to increase their, their health or their fitness for the marathon. And a one, or one definition of movement is an activity where the person does not reaps the non-physical benefits. So biking to work, to get from wherever you are to your workplace rather than to increase your cardiovascular health or squatting down to pick up a pen versus squatting to strengthen the lower body. So uh, technological advancements um, of our generation uh, have reduced the necessity for movement in our lifestyle. And so for example, cars allow us to get from one place to the other without making us walk or bike or do movement to get there. Um, chairs uh, allow us to sit without having to squat down to do what we're doing. And technology like phones, tablets, computers uh, enable us to communicate with others without having to go to them. And so to incorporating diversity of movement into exercise is the solution to this sort of um, lack of diversity of movement that this lifestyle has given us, and chaotic order is the method to this. So uh, the way that Stephanie described, so exercise, you know, an example would be yoga, um, dance, CrossFit, 
um, anything that you, you know, would normally do to rip, reap the physical benefits. Whereas movement, right, um, uh, I don't know, climbing a tree to get your cat, uh, breathing is a movement, uh, squatting down to pick up a pen like we described, biking to work. Okay, these are all sort of diverse movements that, as Stephanie described, are not as common anymore because of the way our lifestyle has developed with technology, for example. So again, the idea is to sort of embrace diversity of movement into exercise um, as a method of, of um, well, enhancing performance, decreasing uh, injury, a number of benefits that could come out of it. And we'll just sort of describe this in a little bit more depth. Um, so really, the idea is exercise, like yoga, okay, especially Bikram yoga, is anyone familiar with this? When you go to Bikram yoga, it's always in the heat, it's always the same temperature, and you go through the exact same movements every time. Okay, going for a run. You go for a run, you run, I don't know if you can diversify your running, you probably don't want to do that very much, so you go out and to train for a run, you run. So basically here, you have routine, right? You're sort of stuck with what you would normally do in your particular area of exercise. So the idea is to introduce some diversity or some disorder into your daily movement exercise type routine. Um, and there's a lot of interesting benefits that could come from that. Okay, so that's sort of the idea. So again, if we consider running, uh, it mainly, and this isn't, these aren't all the benefits, but cardiovascular health is the major benefit of running along with some lower body strength. And um, so it's very routine based in training to get better at running, you run, as Dr. Carrillo said, and you run this many miles one day, this many miles the next, and it's very scheduled. So it, running has a lot of repetitive motions with limited diversity, and your advancements are very within a very limited range of motion. And due to this limited range of motion, uh, runners can be susceptible to injury. So a study done in 2015 found that a higher frequency of running or longer distance running uh, increases the risk of injury, and that even running one time per week can cause, can lead to overuse injuries. And another study done in 2003 found a decrease in muscular strength and bone mineral density with runners, particularly in the upper body, since that's not used as much or if at all during running. And so with the unintentional introduction of chaos, a person who only trains in running can sometimes collapse or tumble um, depending on the chaos that's introduced. So for example, uh, if they need to move and lift furniture and they haven't trained their upper body and they maybe have lower muscular strength in their upper body, they may not be able to succeed in this activity. Or if their bone mineral density is weakened, um, they could slip and fall on ice and be more likely to fracture. And so with chaotic order, an individual can intentionally incorporate diverse movements into their training, allowing them to be able to deal with this unexpected um, events, these unexpected events more efficiently, and then in doing so, enhance their physical performance in their specialty and in day-to-day -day activities in life. So in sort of a, just in closing, this, this is a, a trend that probably I actually um, Andreas mentioned earlier that that training now is seems to be moving toward being more diverse um, and use CrossFit as, as an example um, and and as there's a presentation later on CrossFit and as you'll see that's sort of just the beginning of what's happening with this sort of movement approach to exercise it's really changing a lot quite drastically actually so um, so what we have happening really then, in summary, is the introduction of this chaotic order. So let's go back to just using the, the exercise and movement example. So you introduce some disorder into your exercise routine, which leads to some, let's say, uh, meaning. So you make some relevant connections between different movements that you, that you do, 
Okay, and then that leads to innovation or, or uh, novel movements, okay, that you uh, couldn't do before. But because you've introduced this disorder, it's taken you to somewhere new. Um, and that could have a lot of interesting benefits as well. Thanks for listening through um, us discuss this for the first time. We really appreciate it and definitely would love to hear your feedback. Thanks.